Hello, everybody. It's really a pleasure to have a conversation with Dana Stabenow, who actually is in my house back in another room while I am <laughs> in my office. <laughs> we thought the Zoom format would, would be fun. So Dana, I know that you're working hard on a new book in your series about the Eye of Isis. So want to give us a little catch up on the first book, Death of an Eye? Um, on the first, the first book is called Death of an Eye, and it's set in Cleopatra in Alexandria in the time of Cleopatra, and it features the Eye of Isis, which is a position, um, a sort of a secret position, sort of the hatchet man for Cleopatra, only in this case, woman. And the existing, the current Eye of Isis dies, and Cleopatra calls on a friend of hers, um, Teta Sherry, to find out um, how Cle uh, Camp, uh, the existing Eye of Isis died and um, to eventually to take up the mantle of the Eye of Isis herself. Got it. So the, the death of, the, of her predecessor, Sherry's predecessor, was suspicious at the very least, right? She was murdered in the streets of Alexandria in the, in the middle of the night, yes. And her body discovered by a sweet streeper the next morning. Right. who went hot foot to the Sherta, who are the local police, who then immediately went hot foot to Cleopatra, and Cleopatra called on Teta Sherry to investigate. So Cleopatra is the latest in a long line of Ptolemy rulers, and she's actually sharing power with her brother, who is a real skis, as far as I can recall in all this, right? Well, yeah. Um, Caesar basically set them both up on a throne. I, you know, the story of Caesar and Cleopatra, I don't have to go into, everybody knows it. Um, but to continue, Caesar was worried about political fallout of his taking um, Egypt as his own personal fiefdom, which he certainly could have done. Um, so he set Cleopatra and Ptolemy up in the tradition of brother-sister marriage or marriages and rulers. And, you know, basically at that point, from that point forward, they were a client state of Rome, but not his personal fiefdom. Got it. So Egypt was valuable to Rome because it was actually the breadbasket of Rome because of the, Lyle, the Nile inundations. It was really fertile. And um, it, we don't think of Egypt that way today. We think of it more in the, in the North African desert sort of thing. But in, in Roman times, it was a really rich agricultural province. It fed Rome. It fed Rome. Also, here's another really interesting thing. You know, one of the main exports of that time of um, Egypt, not just to Rome, but to the rest of the world, was papyrus for paper. Ah, sure. uh, you know, all empires are built on paper, as we know. And Rome, the Roman Empire was, in part at least, built on Egyptian papyrus. That is an interesting point. I mean, I always think of them as having chiseled everything into granite, because that's what we have left. But um, but you're right, for day-to-day -day work, they would have needed um, paper rather than stone. So Cleopatra is young, right? At this point, whatever, she's, I'm trying I, to remember, she died. I think she's 18. I think she's 18. She dies when she's just, just before she's 40. None of these dates are exact. Almost none. Of, I mean, you know, everybody knows the Ides of March when Caesar was killed, but hardly anybody can put a finger on when he was born or when she was born either. Absolutely true. So when you and I were running around Alexandria a year ago this month, looking for Cleopatra and so forth, one of the things we learned is that nobody knows where she's buried, right? No, but they're hoping they're going to find her. They, they think right now they're circling in and that eventually they're going to find her mausoleum. That they're finding, really they're just, they're discovering, it seems like every month we hear another story from Egypt about some new tomb, or well, old tomb that they have newly uncovered. And I think there's much more to be found out about that time. Absolutely true. They also haven't found Alexander the Great, the person who founded Alexandria, which is Cleopatra's capital. And they're using LIDAR, I think, aren't they? That wonderful technique um, that Doug Preston wrote about so well when he was down hacking his way through jungles in Central America. But LIDAR yeah. is a way to, um, to see what's under the ground a lot more clearly than has been possible in the past. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I can't remember the exact thing. When I wrote the review of Doug's book, I went into it more thoroughly. But yeah, it's uh, from the air and um, it's able to see in between the spaces of other things, whereas other radar, so to speak, will just reflect back from those other things. This is uh, has the ability to see in between the spaces. So or see through the spaces in between 
the other stuff that just gets reflected. It sounds more complicated than it is, but it works. So it does work. Well, how exciting if you're writing this series and they suddenly run across, you know, the actual. Oh, my God, it might upset my entire. But, you know, I have I've planned this series out a little bit. And it just if they find something new that just throws, you know, a, a monkey wrench into my um, my the as far as I have got the timeline written out, then I'll just have to like make a left turn. <laughs> well, you know, you can only write you can only write fiction on the basis of what you actually know when you're writing yep. it. Otherwise, it becomes speculative fiction or fantasy. So you don't want to uh -huh. write that. No. I wrote three um, science fiction novels, or, and I think I haven't gone back to look at them. But I would be, you know, and I investigated as much science as I possibly could at the time. And it was as good as I could possibly make it at the time, as based on real science as I could possibly make it at the time. I'm pretty sure if I went back and I read it now, what, 30 years later, it would all be so dated. I probably couldn't bear it. Well, absolutely true. And actually, generally, one of the advantages of writing historical fiction is it doesn't date because it's already dated. But yes. you're right. New, new discoveries certainly could could cast an interesting light. Well, let's switch over to Kate. While I was um, fiddling around with Zoom here, apparently unable to work out how to actually start this meeting, which occasionally happens, I looked up no fixed line because I was sending an order to your publisher and there is a paperback due out on February 1st. Ah. So yeah, I didn't, I hadn't even had a chance to tell you previously. So I just ordered a bunch, but okay. let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, about Kate in No Face Line. And let's go back to, in fact, the book before it, because there was a gap before Kate came back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks a bunch, Barbara. Now I'm trying to remember what those books are about. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, I mean, I'm the editor, so I ought to be able to remember this too, but no. in, in the first one, Kate, Kate has been MIA, and, no um, and we run across um, her secret undisclosed location when there's a, a, isn't this the one with the train, the plane crashes? This is the one where the plane crashes, yes, right. and she's basically exploded out of her bolt hole, yes. Which is a good thing. And we learned a lot in it, I think. Actually, no, Barbara. <laughs> no, you jump, you jump, no, because. Well, um, I was afraid of. Yeah, <laughs> I think, I'm telling you, I don't remember from one book to the other. <laughs> well, I'm embarrassing myself too. Let's just say that Kate is back in, in you know, recovers. Less than a treason. Yeah. I remember the title. <laughs> That's it, no less than a treason. She recovers. Mm -hmm. um, from her trauma, although it's taken her quite a while, and eventually, well, Jim um, is re in recovery too. Right, Jim is in recovery too. It's both of them. Their stories are told in parallel in that book. Yeah. And, yep. And so we also go back in one book or the other, and we learn more about Jack or some Jack's ex-wife, who turns out to still hold a significant grudge. Well, she's also used. She's every bit as she's every bit as much as used as she is a user. I think I had a little sympathy for Jane in this book. It's the first time. So, um, but in the end, you know, she sided with evil instead of with good. So, so some of the things you've been writing about are things that are really coming to the fore at the moment, with you know, drilling into the Arctic, but at the same time, the um, the mine. Uh, apparently the gold mine, which figured in one of these books, um, as you know, yeah. evil exploitation of, uh, yeah. of Alaskan resources. This is, as you often say to me, Alaska, what Alaska does best is take stuff out of the ground. I mean, that's and out of the water. Yep, that's all we do, just pull stuff yep. out of the ground and pull stuff out of the water, yes. Right, the twin, mm -hmm. the twin pillars of Alaskan economy. But anyway, the pebble mine has apparently been blocked for now. Um, but I'm gathering that going after more oil is um, is maybe a last minute thing. Although with any luck, maybe litigation will stop it before it can become reality. Well, they're going to receive significant pushback from the people who live in the area. Right. So as you're writing, Kate, you know, you've been writing about Alaska politics and you've been writing about Alaska resources and so forth. Have the events of the last couple of years inspired you to take a, you know, wider view or are you sticking with Alaska or are you going to venture? And as far as the Kate it? series are concerned, yeah. I'm probably going to be sticking with Alaska and the Liam series as well. I, I think those are Alaska centric and 
<clears throat> Alaska is so big and so incredibly diverse as uh, when it comes to population and to geography um, that I, I just think the stories there are limitless. Absolutely I, true. I um, I took a geography quiz in which the the thing said, you know, no one's ever passed this quiz. So I thought, well, I will certainly prove them wrong. And actually I did pretty well. But one of the questions is, which state has the largest coastline? And, you know, for forever, the answer was Michigan. But when I was a kid, but not anymore. Well, Alaska has about 35,000 miles of coastline. I told that to someone from, I forget where he was, uh, a long time ago. I told him that and he didn't believe me. <laughs> He just, he flat disbelieved me. He just, oh no, that can't possibly be true. But if you count all the islands and all the archipelago that goes and all the peninsulas, you go all the way around from, you know, border to border, it's about 30, 35,000 miles, it's larger tremendous. than the circumference of the earth. Yeah, it's tremendous. I mean, I have sailed from Vancouver, you know, north and I've sailed from Seward all the way around Alaska and then over the top of Canada. So I can truly say that it is a huge coastline. It was exciting to go into the Bering Sea. I mean, for somebody who grew up in Chicago, where, you know, Lake Michigan is the only body of water and it's also in the wrong direction. I mean, I, I to this day am programmed that all bodies of water are to the east. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm serious. It was the orienta orientation. When I was at Stanford, I never could get it right. I was absolutely sure the Pacific Ocean was over there east, even though it was the bay. But, you know, it's hard. It's hard to get your reference points, you know, the way you grow up. And so in Alaska, the Bering Sea is obviously west. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Tolkien, you know, if you're going to, you know, march off with the elves or something. So I thought it was really exciting to um, to see all that. There's a very good thriller out by Mark Cameron, who's an Alaskan writer. And I hope I'm going to introduce you to him at some point. He is an Alaska trying to remember if he's a PI or a cop in his own series, but he's also writing for Tom Clancy. And in his new book, um, Tom Clancy, The Something of the Dragon, um, the Bering Sea is a major player. There's a Chinese submarine that goes to the bottom of the Bering Sea. And because it's trying to escape all detection, there's just really, really faint signals. So, you know, part of the excitement is, will they rescue all these Chinese sailors? Will they the detect the signal? The Arctic Ocean is um, going to be a place of interest to many, many world powers in the future <laughs> because of the melting sea ice. I mean, they're already running freight over the top. Um, it's going to save a lot of gas. <laughs> so I'm, I'm imagining that fiction is going to follow fact right along. I'm sure it is. We were actually offered a cruise from Vladivostok over the top of Russia all the way to Alaska, the reverse, essentially, of the, um, mm -hmm. the North, well, more than a reverse of the Northwest Passage Group, it's in the other hemisphere, but nonetheless, um, you know, sailing across the top of the world, which we just could not imagine, you know, 50 years ago, who would have guessed that we could do that? So anyway, we do have uh, no less of treason and uh, no fixed line. We do have those available in paperback as of February. But yeah. you have a new book. And one of the interesting things about the Liam Campbell is, are we going to have paperbacks of the first four? Because I think a lot of your fans have either read and forgotten them, such as me, for example, um, or, or has never read them, but would like to read them before they step into uh, Spoils of the Dead. Well, I've been running um, excerpts in anticipation of this um, because my UK publisher, Nick, who um, prints the um, physical copies of the book and then ships them over, told me that he was going to be do this, being doing this. So I started running excerpts from the first four books in the series months ago, and I've been getting some really good response uh, from it. So I am hoping you'll have lots of orders for those favorite maps. Well, me too. I'll first <laughs> figure out how to get them. So. When you set out to write Liam number five, did you have to go back and reread the first four to remind yourself of, of what had happened and who the characters were and all those useful things? I skimmed them, but I really didn't have to go back. I, you know, just like, you know, I went through every page, but I didn't read every word. I skimmed all the way through. Um, and those are my working copies where I've underlined and marginal notations and dog ears and highlights and all that. God, they're a mess. Um, and then um, I had the added advantage of I sent Kate in um, Restless in the Grave, which is the, I believe, 19th Kate Chuyak novel, 
um, Liam went to Jim and asked him for help in a case that uh, he was on because he couldn't meet, there was a personal um, conflict and he couldn't uh, get into it himself. So Jim said, no, he wouldn't come, but he'd send Kate down. And so Kate went down to Newenham and um, solved everything. <laughs> There's some really good scenes in that book. I really love that book, Restless in the Grave. And it was difficult melding the um, two sets of characters, but it was a lot of fun too. It was challenging. I had a good time with it. So Liam was stationed in Newnham, but in Spoils of the Dead, you are relocating him. I relocated him to a bay that is loosely based on Catchmack Bay, which is where I live now. Um, in reality, troopers get moved around a lot. So it was not really realistic to have Liam stay in one place for very long. I could get away with that with Jim because, you know, the strong hand of Ekaterina in the background, as I think I revealed in the last book, was probably responsible for the post getting built in the park and for Jim to be assigned there. Um, but with Liam, I wanted to, and things have changed. At the end of Restless in the Grave, somebody very important to both Liam and Y dies. And um, someone else very important to him at the beginning of this book, we find out, has left as a result of that death. And things have just changed for them. So it's time to go. So they leave. And they're both, I think Y is at present in a little bit better place than Liam is, but Liam's a little confused. He's not quite sure where he's going or what he's going to be doing next. I regard this book as more of a bridge between those first four novels and the next ones that are written in the series. Right. Well, I, you know, it's, it's realistic in a long running series. People's lives change. You know, their relationships change, um, their health changes, they relocate, their jobs change. I mean, Jim's Bye. job has changed over in Kate, you know, I mean, he's, yeah. um, so the only constant in the Kate, the absolute constant in Kate is mud. <laughs> you know, that's been a little lefty for her a couple of times too. Oh, yeah. I am not interested in writing the same characters in the same situation book after book after book after book. I just, that sounds to me like uh, spiritual death. I just couldn't do it. I, not with any conviction. I certainly couldn't. I would be bored writing them and the reader would for sure be bored reading them. Well, I agree with you. And I think, you know, giving them a, a transitional book going from Wynn and, and um, Liam from where they were to a new place is fun. But what I really liked about, no, um, sorry, Spoils of the Dead, um, is that you were able to bring in um, a lot more Alaskan landscape, a little bit different than some of what you've written about. I mean, Wynn is, after all, flies herself. So, you know, you have a aerial view of things. That is, yeah. Yeah. That is a very, I hope the readers put up with that. I really do, Barbara, because I did indulge myself and allow her. I've made that flight myself. And I, so I indulged myself and I, I split it up into two parts. I think with your help, you pointed out that I should do that. And the, the um, just, I let her like sightsee. And I let, I hope that I introduced that entire area to the reader through her eyes. I thought you did it very well. I mean, you know, for some, I've been to Alaska often, and I mean, think it's a magnificent state, but, you know, they, the books are about the characters, but they're also about Alaska. They're also about the landscape, and so to have an opportunity to spend some time, you know, in a part of it that we're not so familiar with is, say, the park. Um, that, was one of the, that was one of the things that I... Uh, uh, the plot lent itself to in um, no fixed line. I was able to put um, Kate and Jim in a plane and they had to fly a bunch of different places. I really love doing that. Alaska is very much a character of the Kate, of the Kate Shugak series and the Liam Campbell series. Oh, it, it just, is. It is. Yeah, and you also point out to me that, um, sorry, the pin is weighing down my sweater. I hate looking at myself when I'm doing this because I'm always <laughs> adjusting my clothing the wrong way too because it's a mirror image. But, um, what was I going to say? Something profound there. What? Well, I've lost it. Um, let me let me go on then for a minute. I'm sure it will come back to me. Um, Alaska being a character, right? No, I got that. I just it'll it'll return. We 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 already welcome done to my question. world. <laughs> We did this today on our walk, you know. You yes, we did. We Great, Brown. <laughs> just a factor of aging, you know, the aging brain. Yes. Anyway, um, the other thing that I thought was really fascinating is that you were able to bring in some 
Alaskan history into um, be, because of this area where they're going. I don't want to spoil the plot or anything, but it turns out that there is some worthwhile Alaskan history that we get to learn um, in a different place. You did that so well in the book whose title I will never remember, um, where you bring in the influenza epidemic and we get to go, you know, to the Alaska village where old Sam um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and learn, see Alaska in a, in a different time when it's being threatened by influenza and so forth. It was though not dead, yeah. Thank you. Oh, good. You can remember your titles. That's excellent. <laughs> that's my favorite Kate book. So, you know, that's easy for me. <laughs> okay. But I really enjoyed this book. I thought that um, you had an opportunity to show us, you know, some different Alaskan history, um, which, and, and the, the short but memorable character arc of one ah. guy, uh, which we worked in, I thought, I thought really was wonderful. And it, you know, it reminds me of something you said to me, I think it was fire and ice. Is that the one with the with the mushrooms? No, that's um, uh, play with fire. Okay, well, close it was fire mm -hmm. in it. Anyway, play with fire. I remember you're saying to me, and I've always remembered this: that Alaska, being a frontier state, is a place where the radical right and the radical left, you know, tend to tend to migrate. A place like that attracts extremes. People mm -hmm. who want to disappear. People who you know have. People who want to live without, you know, without the <laughs> authority. People yes. who people don't want anybody in authority looking over their shoulders. Yes. Well, we won't make any modern parallels, but nonetheless, no. <laughs> um, I I do think um, I think of that in this character in uh, Spoils of the Dead is very much in that vein. I think where you know he gets there's also you know a fair amount of exploitative characters. I mean, from the Klondike gold rush and up. And I was thinking Always. of talking to Laurie and Les last night about their Sherlock Holmes book that the people who really made money off the Klondike gold rush were the people who opened stores and the people oh, yeah. who ran brothels. Because all, you know, you need a whole supply side to sustain um, a rapidly growing population. And so one of the, one of the great stories about the Klondike <laughs> and in particular in Dawson City, is that the staff from the saloons would go underneath the saloons and they would rake up the gold dust that had sifted between the boards to the ground beneath. <laughs> As, and that would be basically their tip for however, however long it had been sifting down. But they literally did that. They literally did that. The, 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 and in this case, in Spoils of the Dead, um, the guy who starts this town is a, you know, a grifter and a thief from outside who comes up and sells land that isn't his. <laughs> yes, like they do in Florida. My grandmother once got caught in a Florida land scheme like that. Of a I've always remembered it. She bought some, you know, lot somewhere in the swamp and it all turned out to be one of those real estate scams. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those are, I think, endemic to frontiers. Yeah, well, yeah, I think they are too. But anyway, I think there's a lot to love in this um, Spoils of the Dead. And I'm yeah. really looking forward for your fans to connect with it. And I will do my very best to get a hold of the earlier paperbacks. I can say for those of you who are being impatient that they do exist as audiobooks. Um, I think it must be from Audible because mm -hmm. you can order. Uh, so. uh, God, you know, I don't. I think they're. I think they're. They're either with. They're out there. They're they're okay. out there. It's either they're Tantor. The most recent ones are with Tantor. Um, I think um, there's another audio audible audio book business, not Audible. Although who knows, Audible may have bought them by now. <laughs> who knows? They think. buy everybody. So well, I, I can order yet. them from the Amazon distributor, which is why I think it's an the, the four. Ooh. And I would like to assure the faithful that all that the narrator is always and ever. Marguerite Gavin. So nobody has to worry that the voice of the Stabino Uvra has changed. <laughs> Wonderful. That's really good. Well, I will certainly look forward to it. Let's um, remind everybody that you're going to launch Spoils of the Dead um, February 6th mm -hmm. at the Poison Pen. But you know what? We never did agree on a time. It's a Saturday. Do you have? Thoughts? I thought it was two o'clock in the afternoon. Do you want to change that? We can. It's up to you. Um, let's go for now. Two o'clock Mountain Time, which would be four o'clock Eastern Time and one o'clock Pacific Time. But we might fool around with that a little bit. Um, but anyway, the key date is February 6th. And the books we 
you know, Dana's not going to rush off like she did last time. So we have to chase her all the way to Alaska <laughs> for extra books if we run short. So we should be okay. But um, I'm really looking forward to having them and to selling them. Dana, thanks for talking to me this morning. Entirely my pleasure. Thanks, Barbara. Right. Bye. Bye.